One thing we need to talk about briefly, though, is you've all been scared of talking about causation um, because we've been drilling it into your heads to never talk about causation. Correlation is not causation. Um, but what I want to convince you of for this class is that is not always the case. And the way I want to convince you of that is uh, to talk briefly about this idea here. Um, there's this law on the internet called Godwin's Law, which is the idea that um, as you see a longer and longer forum discussion or Facebook conversation, um, especially about like political topics, you'll notice that somebody will eventually mention Hitler or the Holocaust or Nazis and compare somebody to Nazis or compare somebody to Hitler or say they're not as bad as Hitler or something like that. And as soon as that happens, you've crossed the Godwin's Law threshold. Um, this is named after uh, or named after this guy named Mike Godwin. He's still alive. Um, he invented this term because he noticed back in the 1990s that people did this all the time on the internet. We still do. Um, and basically it says that as a discussion gets longer, the probability of somebody mentioning Nazis or Hitler approaches one, which means it's going to happen. And once it happens, um, the conversation's kind of dead. Um, and you, you're not going to get any more progress. You're not going to convince anybody of your point because they dropped the Nazi card. Um, and so according to Mike Godwin here, he says, never do this. Like, that's not a good rhetorical move. Um, don't, don't start talking about Nazis and making Nazi comparisons because that is like hyperbolic and it breaks everything. Um, he has clarified this um, because he's still alive and active on the internet. Um, so in 2017, um, there was a march in Charlottesville of a whole bunch of neo-Nazis. Um, and people started comparing them to Nazis and saying, oh, look, we have Nazis marching. And lots of people were saying, you're violating Godwin's law. You're making it so discussion doesn't work online. So Mike Godwin actually uh, weighed in and said, if you're talking about actual Nazis, this doesn't apply. Talk about actual Nazis, like the ones in Charlottesville. Um, but if, if you're just talking about um, um, health insurance death panels during Obamacare back in 2010, don't, don't bring up the Nazis there. Um, so the reason we talk about this is that I argue that there is a Godwin's law for statistics um, when you're talking about stats. And this is the idea that correlation does not imply causation. Um, we drill it into your head so often um, that that is often the one thing people remember from stats classes. Um, the issue, though, is that often correlation does imply causation, and we don't give you any tools to determine if correlation does mean causation. And even if it doesn't, it's a useless phrase and it kills all discussion about things. Um, there was an article a few years ago in Slate about this um, where they, they found that in most um, reporting about scientific studies or uh, other things that are well-controlled, well-designed experiments. Um, often one of the very first comments in any of these um, articles about causal stories is that correlation doesn't imply causation, correlation is not causation, um, there are so many variables here that isn't even funny, face palm, um, and so they found that just people love saying this. And you'll see it all the time now, especially with um, discussions about um, different COVID-19 um, studies and trials. Um, you'll see very often um, the very first response to a new study is that this is just correlation, not causation, therefore throw it away. Um, so I would argue don't do that. Um, causation is hard to find, but it is findable. Um, so don't just rely on this and just kill all discussion. There are ways of finding causation. It's tricky, though, um, because with causation, with correlation, we can figure that out. Um, you can use Excel to figure out correlation. It is just a function. You can say equals, I think it's C-O-R. In R, it's C-O-R. In Stata, I have no idea, but I think, I think it's probably just C-O-R. In SPSS, you look in a menu somewhere, and you can figure out how to figure out correlation. Um, and so it's just math and statistics. It's just a mathematical formula that you can use to figure out correlation. Um, so the question is, how do we figure out causation? Is there a causal function in Excel or R or Stata or SPSS? Can you type equals causation of two columns? No, you can't. And the, the reason why is because causation is not based on math. Um, it's based on philosophy. Um, you have to have a philosophical model of the causal process, um, and it's, there's no math involved. It's all just logic and philosophy. And it's not a magical binary thing of saying this thing is causal, this thing's not causal. Um, 
uh, one of my friends online works in Silicon Valley um, at different data science jobs. And he overheard colleagues saying, like, throw more control variables in so it becomes more causal. Like, no, that's not how it works. There's not some magical threshold of causation and not causation. Um, there's no pure causal story. There's no pure non-causal story. Um, so one of my friends here argues that like causality is not achieved, it's approached. There's no way of getting perfect causality, and it's not a binary idea. You have this continuum um, where some things have good causal stories in them, some are very, very clear evidence of causation, um, but it's not a clear-cut binary thing. Um, so what is this idea of causation anyway? Um, so how do we know if something X causes something else? Why? If a program causes a reduction in poverty? Um, so we'll talk about this briefly. So X causes Y if we intervene and change X without changing anything else. So if we can somehow hold everything else constant and only wiggle around X, if we do that and Y changes, then we can say that X has a causal impact on Y. Um, another way of talking about this is, is this idea that Y listens to X. Um, we have this long quote here from um, a guy named Judea Pearl. Um, I won't read it. You can read it here. But his idea is that um, if Y responds to changes in X, then that means Y listens to X. And that listening relationship is causation. And so um, Y doesn't the, the nice thing about this is Y doesn't have to listen to only X. Um, other things can cause Y, but X is going to be one of the things that will cause Y. So if you wiggle X up and down, Y will change. If you wiggle Z up and down, maybe Y will change too. But what we care about is just that X. And if we can say that there's a causal, like, causal link between X and Y, then we have causation. Um, so that's causation, this, this listening to principle. Um, so let's look at some of these here. If you light fireworks, does that cause noise? Yeah, it does. Um, so again, listening to, so does noise listen to, or sound waves, do those listen to explosions of fireworks? Yes, explosions of fireworks cause sound waves, which cause noise. Um, rooster crows, do they cause the sunrise? Um, because they will crow and then the sun will come up. Um, the issue there is it, the sun does not respond to it. Um, if we're thinking about listening there, the sun doesn't care if a rooster crows at it. Um, it's just going to do its thing anyway. And so that is not a causal story because the, the, the responsiveness is different. And there's no way of proving responsiveness there. Um, there's this idea here. Getting an MPA or an MPP degree will increase your earnings. You hope that that is a causal story. That is why you are in this program. You're hoping to have a better career and be a more effective public servant and hopefully get a raise. Um, that's the whole purpose of grad school um, in this degree here. Um, being able to prove that causal relationship, that's going to be a little bit tricky. Um, you'll have to somehow isolate that MPA degree. Um, if we could live in a parallel world, you could say, here's me with an MPA, here's me without an MPA which of me has the higher income, and then you can, you can definitely say that it was because of the MPA. We don't have a time machine, we have no way of doing that, but theoretically there should be a causal story there. Um, finally, there's this idea of um, if you take vitamin C when you feel like you have a cold, does that cause the cold to go away? Um, and surprisingly, it doesn't much. Um, they've done all sorts of experiments on this, and they, from the best evidence I've seen, there is kind of a causal link. Um, if you take a ton of vitamin C a few days before you get sick, um, it will decrease the length of the sickness by like eight hours, um, which is like a third of a day. Um, but that's the only way it's going to work. But we still do it in, in hopes that it'll happen. Um, but there's not a lot of evidence there. And so, again, colds do not listen to vitamin C. So if we think about the listening metaphor, um, there's no clear connection there. Um, so another way of thinking about this here is um, this definition here, which is my favorite simplest definition, um, which is that causation is correlation, time order, and non-spuriousness. So correlation means the two move together. Um, so roosters crow at the sun in the morning and the sun comes up. There's correlation there. Time order, um, 
if the rooster's like a little bit early before the sun, maybe the rooster happens before the sun. That's the time order idea. Um, non spuriousness is where the rooster story dies. Um, there's a spurious link between there. There's no plausible story between a rooster causing the sun to come up. And so cause the causal story dies at that point. Um, and so if you can apply kind of this, these three definitions here, if there's correlation, the ordering is right, and it's not a wild story that makes no sense, um, then you can have causation as long as you can prove those three things. But how do you know if you have it right? Um, how do you know if you have the correlation correct, the time order correct, and non-spuriousness? The rooster story, that's clearly a spurious story, but in lots of social programs, it's really hard to prove that spuriousness, and how are you going to make sure that, that there is an actual relationship there? And that's where it gets really tricky. In order to do that, you need to have a philosophical model of your causal story. You have to be able to somehow map out what you think makes why change? What makes the sun rise? What makes your earnings higher um, because of an MPA? What makes you get better because of a cold? Um, so you need that philosoph philosophical model to be able to understand all of the different impacts and or all of the different inputs into um, the causation of the, the outcome there. Um, and so that is why we're taking this class. This class is going to give you the tools for making your causal models explicit so that you can measure those connections and measure the causation and prove causation given these causal models. Um, this has become a very popular way of, of looking at the world um, based in part on this guy's work here. This is Judea Pearl. Um, he's an Israeli computer scientist um, that has been working on causation for decades since the 70s and 80s. Um, his work has become very popular in the social sciences over the past five-ish years. Um, his, the, the best introduction to his work, I'm not going to have you read this book, but if you're interested, you should check it out. It's called The Book of Why. Um, it's kind of the most um, accessible version of all of his um, causal theories. Um, and it, it, it's co-written by kind of this journalist guy, so it makes it more accessible to regular people. Um, so I'd recommend reading that. He tells all sorts of stories about how nobody believes his causal theories, and now they're taking over the world, and that's great. So read his stuff. It's fun. Um, but the most important um, contribution he made is this idea of being able to graph out your causal philosophy. And what he calls it is a directed acyclic graph or a causal diagram that shows the connection between the different um, parts of your causal story. So let me move myself out of the way so you can see here. So a directed acyclic graph has three parts to the name here. Directed means um, you have these different nodes here. So you're saying X leads to Y. Um, with these arrows, you can say causes. You say X causes Y. Z causes X and Z causes Y. Um, they're directed because there's arrows. It's acyclic because there's no way to cycle back to one of the nodes. So you can't start at Z here, go to X, go to Y, and somehow get back to Z. Um, once you started a node, you can't get back to it. And so that's what acyclic means. Um, that also means you can't have a, an arrow with two arrows on it. So you can't go from X to Z to X to Z. You just have to go from Z to X. Um, and then graph it means it's a graph. Um, so that's, that's the easy part to remember there. Um, but why these are important is that they are a, a model of how the data is generated. Um, so if you're trying to map out the causal relationship between your program and poverty, for instance, um, your program is going to do something to poverty, but other things cause poverty as well. Um, and your program will cause something which will then cause poverty. Um, and so there's all sorts of different um, components of poverty as a social phenomenon. Um, and your program is going to be one aspect of that. Um, but what we care about is we can do stuff to isolate the relationship between your program and the outcome. Um, and so that's where we have this fancy math, this idea of do calculus, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks, um, which are specific rules you can use with these graphs to isolate specific pathways. So if we want to isolate the relationship between X and Y and get rid of Z, because right now Z is causing both X and Y, so we can't really tell a causal story between X and Y because Z is messing it up. We have tools of getting rid of Z here, getting rid of the effect of Z, 
So that all we're left with is the causal effect of x to y. And that is the whole goal of this class, is to be able to isolate these pathways between x and y. Okay? So we care about these graphs. They can be simple. Um, they can be simple. Here's a very simple graph here showing that education causes earnings. So the more education you have, the more money you make in theory. Um, that's very, very simple. You can get more complicated here. So here's a graph showing that education causes earnings, but earnings are also caused by location where you live, your background, the year you're born. Um, sometimes there's recessions when you graduate from college. Um, education causes you to get job connections because of networking, and then those job connections cause you to get better earnings. Um, so you can see all of these different phenomena, how they're linked here, um, and can mess up the pathway between education and earnings. And so if we can use the fancy do calculus rules to make it so that we can isolate the education to earnings pathway, then we can tell a causal story. And that is our goal. Um, you can draw these dags for all sorts of phenomena. Here is a, a dag showing the, the link between smoking and heart attack. Um, and it goes through cholesterol. So smoking causes higher cholesterol, which then causes cardiac arrest. Um, smoking is not the only thing that causes cholesterol. Weight causes that too. Unhealthy lifestyles cause weight and cause smoking. And so being able to prove that there's a link between smoking and cardiac arrest is a little bit tricky because you have weight and unhealthy lifestyle that are messing up that relationship. But if we can do something to isolate that pathway between smoking, cholesterol, and cardiac arrest, then we can argue for causation. Um, you can even get wild dags like this here. This is the effect of smoking on fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and they've got like a billion different nodes here with arrows all over the place, and it looks like a huge mess. But the cool thing about this is you can still use the rules of do calculus to isolate the pathway between smoking and um, fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, you can control for specific nodes, and that's enough to kind of block all of the different pathways that you care about so that you can get the one that you need. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a few weeks, but this is kind of the, the super exciting part about these DAGs is you can actually isolate specific pathways and then talk about causation based on those pathways. And so I will give you, we'll, we'll cover all of the different tools for isolating these pathways. Um, and, and these are fun um, because once you start getting familiar with DAGs and being able to draw these DAGs, um, you can critique people's um, causal stories um, fairly well. Instead of just saying correlation is not causation, um, if you have a causal model, you can critique the causal model and say you're missing one of these links or you're missing a node that also causes something, um, which is a lot more educated of a critique than just saying correlation is not causation, that's dumb. Um, I accidentally did this um, back in 2019. There's this fun study from the New York Times showing that if you want to live longer, go to the opera. Going to the opera increases your life expectancy. Um, and so I just like jokingly retweeted it and said, like, I can draw the dag for this one. So going to the opera does cause you to live longer, but being rich makes you go to the opera and being rich makes you go or makes you live longer. So it kind of messes up the causal story there. Um, I ended up getting, I think it was the Los Angeles um, Opera House Twitter account. They got mad at me and started yelling at me saying that they have like discount tickets for people. And I was like, I, no, I, I wasn't joking about that. I was joking about the study. Sure, get people to the opera. That's neat. Um, but don't say that going to the opera causes you to live longer because there are other things that mess that up. And you can see that clearly in the DAG. And you can critique people a lot more effectively this way. So... Causation is tricky. Um, we'll be talking about it throughout the semester of how we can actually um, connect um, these causal diagrams, draw these, di these causal diagrams for social programs, and then be able to tell causal stories using observational data, um, using non-experimental data um, to prove causal stories. And that's kind of the most exciting part about this class is you can legally talk about causation as long as you have a well-defined DAG and a good story and good statistics to back it up. Mm -hmm.